Well, my name is Mark Labhart, and I am currently a county commissioner. I'm in my eighth year, my second term. Um, first time I didn't have anybody run against me. Um, second time I didn't have anybody run against me. Uh, qualifications for being a county commissioner? Well, I've lived in the county for 26 years. Uh, some people say I'm not a local yet. <laughs> Even though I've lived here for 26 years, you have to live here for like 30 years to be a local. Um, my previous experience, I spent 34 years with the Department of Forestry. So I'm a forestry graduate from Oregon State University. Um, spent uh, the majority of my career here in Tillamook, managing the Tillamook State Forest, which is the largest state forest in Oregon. Uh, following my retirement after 34 years with the Department of Forestry, I chose to run for the county commissioner seat. Um, uh, qualifications, you know, I currently serve on the Association of Oregon County's Board of Directors. I serve on the legislative committee, so I spend a lot of time in Salem uh, lobbying and working for Tillamook County. Um, I'm on the Columbia Pacific Economic Development District. I uh, have chaired that uh, before. Uh, community service, you know, I was uh, chosen as Tillamook County Citizen of the Year, um, served as uh, president of the Kiwanis Club in Tillamook, so I'm active in community kind of things. I serve on the United Way Board. I have um, you know, uh, been chosen as Forester of the Year for Oregon by the Professional Society of American Foresters. I was chosen by the Portland Trailblazers as a, what they call a community all-star for doing community activities. So qualifications are that I care a lot about Tillamook. Um, I believe that there's a lot of problems out there that need to be solved. I think I have the skills, I've demonstrated the skills over time to try to address some of the really tough problems in Tillamook County. You know, we can talk about some of those problems, but you know, I just came from a meeting this morning on flooding uh, to uh, try to get some funding to reduce flooding in the North Tillamook area. I've been working in the Nesco Inn area on uh, coastal erosion, uh, attended a meeting the other night on uh, territorial sea plan, uh, ocean energy, those kind of things uh, in North County, um, working to try to get um, more uh, attention in North County regarding health services, services for the elderly, um, those kind of things. So I believe I have, uh, with eight years of experience, I have a lot of qualifications that we won't be able to go over in the time allotted to me, but I enjoy being a county commissioner. I consider it a privilege and an honor to be a county commissioner. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, uh, do I support the, the library levy? And I can say I'm a very, very strong supporter of the, the library levy. We've had libraries in Tillamook County since 1907. And that's 1907. That is a long time. And we've had an operating levy since 1983. And some people say, well, what's an operating levy? I don't know what that is. An operating levy is essentially the funding system for our six libraries, Pacific City, Tillamook, Bay City, um, uh, Garibaldi, Rockaway Beach, and Manzanita. It funds the operation of those libraries. It funds the staff, turns on the light, you know, the heat. It pays for the, the computers uh, to provide internet service for those folks who don't have computers. It provides computer classes. Of course, it buys the books. It buys the large print books. It buys the Spanish books. It buys the magazines, the newspapers that people can't afford so they can come into the library and sit down and read a newspaper or read a Time magazine. Um, it provides um, public services. Um, such We have a public meeting rooms. Uh, we have a children's library. It provides all of those services. Uh, E-books where you can go online uh, electronically and download a book. Uh, CDs, music, things, those kind of things. That's the services that an operating levy provides. Um, we've been in an operating levy for a five-year period. So since 2007 is when the operating levy went into effect and it expires June 30th of this year. And so what we told the library board was we would not accept a higher rate for the next five years. So that would be from 2007 to 2017 you, you have to operate the libraries, the six libraries, and I forgot the bookmobile, we have a bookmobile, to operate those within the same rate. So as we all know, probably since 2007 to 2017, the costs have increased over time. 
health insurance, you know, all those kind of costs. But we told the library, times are tough in Tillamook County right now. You have to operate in that 10 year period with the same rate of 65 cents. And so, so that's the selling point is you have to operate in the same rate. You know, and I hesitate to, to say the next statement, but I need to say this because if I don't, some people will say, well, why didn't you tell us this? And then on the other side, some people will say, well, you're threatening us. So I'll just give you the facts and then people can draw their own conclusions. If the bond, or excuse me, if the operating levy does not pass on June 30th, the libraries will close. Why? Because we have no legal authority after June 30th to operate the levy, to the library, excuse me, with the levy. We have no funding to operate them. So they would close and they would close for a minimum of three months. That means we would lay off all the library employees. We would close the doors. And, you know, those are, those are citizens that shop in local stores, that buy gas, that, that eat in restaurants, those kind of things. So, you know, those are family wage jobs. And we, we need to keep the library system open. Uh, you know, I feel so strongly about it. I've written an editorial that hopefully will appear in the Headlight Herald, the North Coast Citizen, and the Pacific City Sun. You know, libraries are part of our culture. They've been part of Tillamook County since 1907. We believe strongly in, in people knowing how to access services, being able to read, to be, get on the internet, um, and teaching kids the love of reading. And so that's, you know, I, I just feel really strongly about support for the library, and I sure hope that people will vote for it. It, it is something that we need to. It doesn't raise your taxes. It does not raise any taxes. It keeps the same rate. And by the way, in the next two years, we're going to have two bonds expire. The jail bond expires and the hospital bond expires. So that's 41 cents per thousand that will be not assessed to the property taxpayer. So that they will not see that on their property tax statement. So it reduces by 41 cents. So, you know, um, as you can tell, I feel pretty strongly about our library system. It's six libraries. We're keeping the rate the same. Um, we need to keep our uh, library system going. It's part of our culture. It's part of what makes Tillamook County a special place. So the question is, how, how do I feel about roads and what should be the county's response on roads? You know, this is a, this is a pretty frustrating point for me because <clears throat> um, every, uh, every five years, the Association of Boarding Counties has an independent engineering firm that does a survey of all the county roads in Oregon and rates all the county roads. And the Oregon Department of Transportation has the same survey done. It's rated on a scale from zero to 100. ODOT tries to keep their roads in the 80 to 85 range, and that means that they're in fairly, fairly decent condition. Our roads are in the 40s. And he, he wrote us a letter, the contractor, and he said, I can clearly say with no uh, dispute that you have the worst county roads in the state of Oregon. And that is that hurts. That hurts pretty bad. I mean, we have worse county roads than roads in eastern Oregon and Wheeler County and Grant County and really rural counties. We have the worst county roads. Well, part of the reason is because we have such a, the weather is, is hard on our county roads and we have a lot of heavy trucks. We have farm trucks. We have logging trucks. We have a lot of people getting goods to market. And with the weather, freeze, thaw, rain, wind, cold, you know, it, it beats up our road system. And we have funding from essentially three sources, state funds, federal funds, and, and uh, grants. And the state funds are gas tax, motor vehicle registration fees, those kinds of things. The federal funds used to be the federal forest receipts. And without going into a lot of detail, what we did was when the federal forests, they don't pay property taxes. So in lieu of paying property taxes, when federal timber was harvested, we got a portion of that revenue. And Tillamook County dedicated that to roads because those forest products are coming out of county roads, coming out of the forest, hitting county roads, going on to state roads, and going to the mill. So we dedicated all of that revenue to fixing up county roads. Well, with the environmental situation that occurs with the spotted owl and the marble murelet and endangered species and all those kind of things, the federal harvest plummeted. 
We used to harvest 90 million board feet a year on the Hebo Ranger District. The last I heard, we were harvesting about 9 million. It's just plummeted. So that revenue has gone away. So what Congress did was they gave a reauthorization by putting this thing in place called the Secure Rural Schools, where they said, okay, even though we aren't harvesting timber, we will take the revenue that you would have received from the harvest of timber and we'll give you that. And they gave it to us for a period of four years and then it went away. So we asked for a reauthorization. They gave us a reauthorization. They said, but hey, you got to figure out some other way after four years. And so it's, it, it sunsetted or went away. And the way, uh, this year we received zero. Now, just as we were talking a little bit earlier, we just got word today, which is one of the good news things, that both Senator Wyden and Senator Merkley were able to get a reauthorization for one year, one year, of the secure rural schools dollars. We used to get nationwide 500 million. We're going to get about 300 million this time, of which it's going to ramp down at 5%. So we're not. We're going to get a significantly less than we used to get, but we're going to get something that's going to carry us over for a year. Is it enough to fix county roads? No. We have a $40 million problem that we need to pave county roads right now. And I hear about it, Anthony, I hear about it every day. People say, when are you going to fix my road? You know, uh, I've got so many potholes on there. You know, I, uh, I just went to Les Schwab and had a $400 tire or wheel repaired. Uh, wheels are very expensive when you break a wheel. You know, Mike uh, St. Clair from Les Schwab says, Mark, you guys are killing me. You're killing me because I have this thing called a road hazard warning. So if they buy their tires at Les Schwab and I break it on the road, they bring it back to Les Schwab and they got to give them a brand new tire. Well, not everybody has that warranty. So we've got to do something about county roads. We've tried three different times to ask the voters because it, it, is, it is not the county commissioner's decision. It's, it's our roads. It's not the county's roads. It's, it's everybody's roads. And We've asked them through a gas tax once before. They said, nope, we don't, they, that went down. We put in a, an operating levy. Um, the voters didn't approve that. And we put in a bond this last time. Out of 8,000 voters, it failed by 400 votes. So now what, what are you going to do about it? That's the next question. So, um, in fact, I met with John Carnahan this morning, who used to be the president of Tillamook Bay Community College. Um, he's moved here, uh, retired now. It's, He's done a lot of uh, bonds and levies and those kind of things, and he's agreed to chair the next campaign. Because we just can't sit on our, on our laurels. We have to fix our county roads. They're a part of our infrastructure. When tourists come here, we want them to drive on good roads. When you're hauling milk to the cheese factory, we don't want them breaking tires. We want the logging trucks not to be swerving around and trying to get around things. We, I want my grandchildren, when they come to visit me, to not drive on the road that I live on, which is a county road that has just massive amount of potholes on it. We need to start a process and we need to get with the voters and say, you know, we want to listen carefully and say, okay, we've tried this, we've tried this, it didn't work. What would you support? Because it is a publicly funded system. They're not the county commissioner's roads. They're your roads. They're our roads. They're everybody's roads. And it's part of having a, having a really strong county is to have good infrastructure. You know, water, sewer, power, those kind of things. If, if you had a poor power system, you know, your, the, your, your lights were going out all the time, you'd be screaming bloody murder. You know, get, the, get those power poles fixed. Well, the same with roads. We need to do something. And so we need to listen carefully. We need to respect the will of the voters who said we don't like this bond, but we need to listen and we need to, to, to help fix our county roads. And we need to do it in a way that we can get the voter approval for it. Well, ocean energy, and, and what, what's my position on ocean energy? Well, I'm a member of TIDE. TIDE stands for the Tillamook Intergovernmental Development Entity. It is a partnership that the county commissioners formed with the Tillamook PUD. And there's four board members, uh, Ray Seeler, who's the manager of the PUD, Barbara Trout is a port, uh, or, uh, excuse me, a board member, uh, myself as a, a board member and a commissioner, and then Paul Levesque is our chief of staff. The purpose of TIDE is, we know that ocean energy is coming. We know that there's interest off of our shoreline because we have two things that the ocean energy companies like. We have consistent waves 
you know, of course we have a lot of storms, but we have a consistent wave. And we're not talking about the waves that break on the ocean. It's those swells that come in. That's what they call waves. And that, those swells are energy. When they move, they move through the ocean. Those are, that produces energy, and they're capturing that energy. And then also, we have a very consistent wind source offshore, 8 to 10 miles out. There's buoys out there that measure the waves, measure the wind, the temperature, those kind of things. And we have a very consistent wind source out there. So there's one company called Principal Power who's now doing a test of a commercial device in Portugal, and the test has proven very positive, that wants to come to Tillamook and do a wind tower that floats out about eight to 10 miles offshore. Now, will you be able to see that? Some people say yes, some people say no, it depends on how far they're out there and how high it is. We've had also interest from, from other companies like Aquamarine, who is very interested in putting a near shore device that acts like a clam, that's the best way to explain it. As the wave goes by, it hits the, the the device, it closes, and as it closes, it pushes water through a device and creates, uh, spins a turbine and creates energy. So Tide was formed because we knew this was coming, and we wanted to have development off of our shoreline that is done in a way that is acceptable to our citizens, because we know it's coming. So not, right now, we're involved in this territorial sea plan, and that's a, what I would, the best way to describe it, it's a zoning of the ocean. So we're zoning areas that are important for crabbing, important for salmon fishing, important for uh, marine cables, important for whale migration. And then whatever's left, you know, areas that we want to make sure that there are areas where you can have ocean energy devices, but done in a reasonable way. Now, the big issue that's coming up right now that I'm very concerned about is what they call uh, view sheds or scenic areas where if you live in a certain community, you may not want to see an ocean energy device off the shoreland. So we need to make sure that we include that in the discussion about ocean energy and this territorial sea plan. Right now, it is not part of the discussion. And we are working very hard, particularly Shirley Cal Colvin of the Futures Council and David Yamamoto on the Futures Council, to make sure that when these plans are developed, these, these territorial sea plan that's going to zone the ocean, that it includes these view sheds. So, you know, I, I believe pretty strongly, and, and this is kind of getting philosophical, but we keep pushing our energy issues and problems onto future generations. We know that we've got enough coal, nuclear, water, energy right now, but into the future, we're not going to have enough. And so this is the generation. This is a generation that has to start addressing our future energy needs because it takes so long. If you think about wind energy, it took 30 years to develop the wind energy along the Columbia Gorge. We need to start with this generation and start planning for the future of energy. And does it include ocean energy? It probably will. But we need to do it in a way that doesn't despoil our beaches, our view sheds, and it doesn't affect our fishing. What about marine reserves? We didn't, we didn't talk about that. Um, you know, I feel pretty strongly about this one also. You know, and I've had, uh, Senator Johnson and I are very good friends. Uh, we talk almost daily. Uh, I was with her uh, for several hours today and I taught, she was meeting with the governor this afternoon. She called me this afternoon to talk about the governor's. Marine reserves is a, is a really key uh, issue for us because there's, there's really strong feelings on both sides. There's, there's one side that says, we don't need marine reserves because we're already being regulated enough by federal law and state law and, and our fisheries aren't at risk. And there's others that say, well, we need, we need areas that are reserves, that are refugia, where fish can, can grow to be big and produce great numbers. And that got lost in the discussion by some environmental groups that said, you know, we've done some polling and we want to put 32 of these along the Oregon coast. And we believe if we put an initiative petition on the ballot that we can get the majority of people in Portland, which is where the big voting block is, to support this because we've done polling. So it was a threat. It was literally a threat that they said, if you don't do something, if you don't do something to, to protect these four areas, these marine reserves, we're going to put this on the ballot. So the legislature took it serious and said, you know, do we, do we say... Bull, we don't believe you, we'll fight you. Um, we did that with the Cougar Bill, and we lost. Um, there was significant polling that says if you don't do something, 
you're going to you're going to end up with these marine reserves. And so, the, the legislature in in what is, it passed like 85 to some 15 in the House and passed handily in the Senate to do these small areas. So, you know, I, I, I trust Senator Johnson to say, you know, this is not perfect, but it is the best we're going to get because the alternative could be a lot worse and it could severely restrict fishing opportunities for our commercial fishing industry. And it is so important that we maintain our commercial fishing industry in the Garibaldi area. In fact, it's so important. I mean, I was the, the person that lobbied the other commissioners to form FACT, the Fisherman Advisory Committee for Tillamook. I, I went over and met with the fishing community, uh, their initial formation meeting to talk about forming FACT, and, and I had one of the fishermen uh, next to me, and he says, Mark, he says, this is unheralded. He says, this, this is, he says, we're a bunch of cowboys. We can't even agree on what time of day it is among the fishing community, whether it's troll, sport, draggers. And he says, for us to come together in a unified fishing fleet to speak with a unified voice, this is unheard of. And they did it. They formed FACT, and now they are an advisor to, to the Board of County Commissioners on issues like ocean energy. They worked with the ocean energy companies to identify sites for them where they said, you aren't going to affect our fishing, crabbing, those kind of things. They worked very hard on the Marine Reserve Bill, and they didn't get what they wanted, but I think in the end, they're going to be a lot better than they would have got with others. And so, so they're a voice, a very clear, a very loud voice that speaks for the fishing community. And I like, you know, I, I like to take credit for that because I think that that's a stakeholder group that has never really conjoined together to speak with a unified voice, and now they're doing that. And, and they're going to speak with a unified voice on future issues that come up. Okay, forestry, fishing, farming, those kind of things. You know, we're a rural county, and natural resources are, are the major part of our county. I mean, it's, if, if we have forests, we have tourism, we have fishing. So, so let me start with first with forests. You know, <laughs> you're talking to a guy that spent 20, 21 years managing the Tillamook State Forest. It's a trust relationship with Tillamook County. When, when those uh, four fires, 33, 39, 45, and 51, pretty much destroyed about half of Tillamook County, and you had the sea of stumps out there, and people said, what are we going to do with this when the private timber companies that own the land reneged on their property taxes and walked away from it? and left this barren landscape, there was some really innovative county commissioners at that time that says, well, how about we approach the state? And they float a bond, they reforest the Tillamook, and they manage it, and when it reaches maturity, we'll give about two-thirds of the revenue back to the county, and by the way, county, you pay the bonds off, and so they said deal. So it's a great relationship. They, they reforested this, it's the largest reforestation project in the world is here in Tillamook County. And this, these trees grew back. It's the best growing place in the world for growing conifer trees. So they grew back fast and they grew back thick. And so we needed to manage those. So you do pre-commercial thinning where you go in and you thin the small trees. And then we did uh, commercial thinning. And so the forest is being managed right now. It's returning on that investment that was made. The money's coming back to the taxing districts. The largest taxing districts in the county are schools. Schools are the largest beneficiary. Nia County School District does not receive any state funds. So all this issue about state funding for schools, Nia County doesn't have to worry about that because they receive so much money from state timber that they, they can fund the resources. So what is, we, we get about $3 million a year for the county budget. And where we use that money, I mean, we're funding sheriff deputies with it. We fund what we call our general services, our clerk, our treasurer, those kind of services. So it, it, it keeps our doors open. It funds part of community development. It funds part of the juvenile department, it, th those kind of things that are general fund services. So we need to protect that investment and that trust relationship. It's a trust relationship between the county and the state on the management of this forest. We need to do it in an environmentally sound way so that these forests will continue to produce timber over the long term, continue to produce environmental benefits. We've got five river systems that flow out of Tillamook State Forest. Some of the best salmon fishing in the world originates in those state forests. There's miles and miles of recreation trails out there for, for ATVs, for hikers. Um, there's a 
tremendous interpretive center out there. We need to continue to maintain that. And the county commissioners are key in making sure that that relationship is, stays as is. So, you know, state force is a big issue. Now, quickly in the last couple minutes that I have, let's talk about farming. You know, it's the lifeblood of Tillamook County. I mean, uh, Tillamook cheese, the brand Tillamook cheese it is, is huge. We provide a lot of family wage jobs. We need to protect farmland. We need to maintain farmland. And we need to do it in a way that protects that heritage and that tradition. So whenever we have a land use issue that comes up, I always ask the Tillamook County Creamery Association, the Tillamook County Farm Bureau to weigh in and say, what is your opinion on this? What should we do? Uh, this, this farm, uh, they, they want to create houses or they want to move to this. And so I asked the Creamery Association, I said, give me your opinion on this. What, is, what would you like to do? I asked the Tillamook Farm Bureau. And 99% of the time I listen to what they say. Uh, you know, it, it, they don't take positions on whether a farmer can sell their property or not, but they do take positions on what they call no net loss of farmland. And so, and then we need to talk about the flooding issue, but maybe we can talk about that on another, <laughs> another segment. Okay, let's talk about flooding. Um, you know, when uh, Tillamook has had, Tillamook County has had 14 federally declared disasters since 1996. That's probably more than any other county in the entire nation in terms of federally declared disasters. Most of those have been flooding. Some have been wind storms and those kind of things, but most of them have been flooding. Uh, when I first became a county commissioner, you know, I became increasingly frustrated with these repetitive floods that we were having and we weren't addressing them, particularly in the North Tillamook area. We just continued to get flooded and flooded and flooded. So I called, with, uh, called together what they called a flood summit, brought together property owners, state agencies, federal agencies, um, Senator Johnson, Representative Boone, and brought, we had 50 people in the room and said, you know, are you as frustrated about flooding as I am? And do we need to address flooding? Do we need to try to fix this issue? And some people said, oh, we've tried that for years. We, we don't get anywhere. The state agencies, the, the permitting processes, the feds will stop you. You're just wasting your time. And I said, well, I think I've got the enthusiasm to try this. And Senator Johnson said, you know, I've worked on this thing called the Oregon Solutions Project. And what Oregon Solutions is, is it's, it's designated by the governor and it's problems that are very severe or problems that people say, there's no way to fix this. We, yeah, you're not gonna fix this problem. So we said, we wanna try to address it. Now there's people sitting over on the sidelines saying, yeah, sure, been there, done that. So the governor sent a representative out here, went to the coffee shops, talked to property owners. And you know, they said, we're so frustrated, we might as well give this a try. So we formed the Oregon Solutions Project. There's 35 members on the project team. They had to sign what they call a Declaration of Cooperation, which said that they'll stay at the table. And not only was it private property owners, it was state agencies, the permitting agencies, the federal agencies, the Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA Fisheries, they were at the table. And every meeting, all three congressional staffers, you know, at that time it was Gordon Smith, but, but now it's Merkley, Wyden, and Congressman Schrader. They sent staff people to every one of those to make sure that the federal agencies played. And so we got a million dollars from the legislature, thanks to Senator Johnson. We put in two uh, big spillways, $300,000 spillways at the mouth of the Wilson and the mouth of the, of the Trask to address issues. We moved a, removed a large dirt pile out on the old Dean property where he used to park his cars. Every time there's a flood, he'd drive them up on top of the, this big dirt pile. Well, it was right in the middle of the flood way. And so the water had to go around this. And we have a, an interesting flood area the, the dikes around the river are higher than the farmland. And so when the floods come and the water flows over the dikes, it goes down into the farmland. Well, it can't get back into the rivers because the farmland is lower. So it immediately tries to find the lowest spot. Well, guess where the lowest spot is? It's right out here by Safeway between Hoke Wharton and uh, I forget the other slew's name, but that's where the water comes through. So it continuously floods there. So what we did was we said, okay, let's look at a, uh, what they call a Southern Flow Corridor project. And what the problem was is all this floodwaters was coming through and it was running into these old dikes that were built back in the 18, late 1800s when they were used to have tugs coming in and out of there. They built all these dikes. Well, they've all failed. 
And so now you've got this big mishmash of dikes. So the water goes in, hits these dikes, and starts backing up into Tillamook and floods this. So this Oregon Solutions Project proposes to move all these dikes to create a new diking system to get the water out to the bay quicker. Will it stop flooding? No. Will it reduce flooding significantly? Yes. And, and when you're talking about reducing flooding significantly, you're talking about you know, flooding at Fred Myers, flooding at Dairy Queen, or not the old, the old Dairy Queen site, but flooding at uh, the subway, those kind of things. That's what the Southern Flow Corridor Project does, it reduces that. So um, we're looking at securing some FEMA funding, $4.5 million of FEMA funding to do this project. And that's part of the meeting that I was in this morning um, with the project team to talk about an appeal to FEMA to try to, to reduce flooding. So that's Tillamook. Well, what about South County and North County? They have flooding issues too. We have, we have a significant effort going on throughout the county to look at flooding issues. Uh, raising, you know, the city of Nahalem, we were worked really strongly there with FEMA to help raise the structures there to, to secure dikes. Down in South County, the same kind of issues. We, we need to uh, support the efforts to protect the dikes, protect the farmlands, raise the structures. We have this program called Hazard Mitigation Grant Program where there's funding that I chair, I chair that committee, to uh, there's millions of dollars in there where it used to be to do house raising to move people around to actually if somebody says i'm done with it to help buy out like safeway safeway said we're done we're moving they moved and they still have the old building well fema i work really closely with fema to, on the buyout for that because safeway said we're done and that's right in the floodway so lots of things going on with flooding we could talk about it for a long time it's an important issue in the county and it's important to me I've worked on the county budget for seven years, and um, the, the keys with the county budget are is we have general fund, which is funded by property tax. And some people say, well, the property taxes are too high. Well, if you've been watching the news lately, you're seeing most counties, the property taxes are really low. In fact, Curry County is one of the lowest in the state, and we're, we're like number 10 out of 36 counties with the lowest property tax in the state. Property taxes are frozen. It was done by Measure 5. So we're not going to raise property taxes. Uh, so we have to live within the means of, of those. So in order to provide the services that people demand and that people, uh, that people, you know, they demand it and they expect that, you know, they're going to have services. You know, let me give you an example. Um, when I ask people on, on the street, you know, what is most important to you in Tillamook County? And, and the, the, you know, some of them will say jobs, but a lot of them say keep me safe keep me safe. I, I want to know that I can go home and be safe in my home. So that's law enforcement. That's county sheriff deputies. That's state police. Now state police numbers have been reduced over the years. And so, you know, I don't know if people realize it or not, but a few years ago we didn't have 24-hour coverage. If you called 911, there's nobody out there, unless you're in the city of Tillamook. But there's nobody out there. And most of Tillamook County is rural. Tillamook North, there's cities. Tillamook South, there's no cities. It's all unincorporated. It's all the county does provides those services. You know, Pacific City is the second largest unincorporated city in Oregon, and it's not a city. The county provides the services. The county provides law enforcement services. So the, the county does the, the land use planning in the neighborhoods. And, and I believe, you know, that counties don't provide very good urban services. We were never set up to do that. But that's the way it is. These are, these are communities. You've got, you know, uh, Cape Mears, Oceanside, Neatarts, uh, Beaver, Hebo, Tierra del Mar, Pacific City, Nesquint, all unincorporated communities. So we have to build into the county budget the management of those, of those communities. So you have the general fund. So that, the general fund helps to do that. And then as I talked to you about it before, we have this timber money. And that's what's saving our bacon right now is the state timber money that helps uh, the general fund to provide those services. To, you know, to keep, keep the grants going, federal and state grants. We, we got some ERA funding, which was the stimulus money to keep our jail open, uh, to provide some law enforcement officers when we were significantly reduced. But every year, you know, I take a look at the county budget. I also look at the Futures Council. The Futures Council does surveys of county citizens every so often, and they ask what's important. And so I look at what the citizens say are important and then try to budget for that. And we're never going to satisfy everybody's needs and demands. But I try to do the best I can as part of the budget committee. The budget committee is made up of six people, three lay people, three citizens, and three county commissioners. 
and then we develop the budget. We try to spread those dollars, those thin dollars, as best we can to provide all those services. And it, it, it is really diverse. I mean, if you, if you ask us sometime, well, what, what do you work on? You know, some days I'm working on county fair issues. Some days I'm working on veterans issues. Uh, might be working on a land use issue the next day. Uh, well, in the same day, I might be working on a roads issue uh, one day. And then um, there's an assessment issue. I mean, it just goes on and on and on about what services. People kind of are blown away when you start talking about all the services that the county provides. And so the key is you know, work within the constraints that you have for the budgets that you have. And, and the issues that we talked about earlier is we don't have the dollars for the roads program anymore because of the loss of the federal timber revenue. So we have to find the revenue that people expect to keep our road systems open. Same with the library, it's not an operating levy. You know, our parks program, we have the largest county parks program of any county in the state of Oregon. People don't realize that. But when you look at Bayview, Bay, Barview County Park, it's one of the largest county parks in the state. Trask Park, there's like 90 sites up there. We manage the park system and we operate that with fees. Boat launch sites, county operates the boat launch sites. I mean, you put your boat in to go fishing, that's a county site. And we have to maintain that. We have to budget for it. We have to make sure that there's enough fees. Second home rentals. Um, when people, you know, my, my grandchildren came down recently and they wanted to stay at the beach. And so my son wanted to have them at a, uh, at a beach rental house. And so I felt good about that because I knew that the, the rental fee that they're paying included a fee to the county. And the county inspected that rental to make sure that it's safe. So that I knew as a as moving into a commercial house, because it's a rental, it's a commercial house, that I knew that they were going to be safe. I knew that there was going to be um, smoke detectors. I knew that the railings were safe. I knew that there was escape routes, those kind of things. And so, you know, that's another county service. So long story short, um, you know, there's never enough money to go around. It's my job to make sure that we spend it as efficiently and effective as possible by listening to what our citizens say are important. And I try to do that. So what would I like to say to the people of Tillamook County? You know, um, for the last seven years, and, and when I say this statement, people go, oh, you're kidding me. I really do enjoy the job. And they go, what? How could you possibly? You're dealing with all these issues and phone calls and stuff. You know, it, it, for the most part, some days are better than others, of course, but for the most part, I do very much enjoy the job. I consider it a, a privilege. And, and when I introduce myself, when people ask, you know, go around the room and introduce themselves at the table, I say, I have the privilege of being a county commissioner because I see it as a privilege. It's an honor um, bestowed on the citizens. There are certain expectations of the citizens that they give me. They expect me to work hard, and I do. The other day, I, was, I went to a meeting, left at 5.30 through the snowstorm to go to a, a Red Cross Breakfast of Champions meetings with 500 people there, and then I had to be back in... <laughs> I had to be back up at Neoconi for an interview for the school superintendent by 10 o'clock. Got in the snowstorm with three semis sideways up on the top of the hill. Then I went down to, had to be at the chamber meeting in Pacific City at noon. Then I had to be back in the office to do some office work and then back down in Pacific City 5.30 for a territorial sea plan meeting. So, I mean, I got into bed, I got home about 9.30. So 5.30 to 9.30, what's that, 16 hours? Um, that's not a typical day. I don't spend 16 hours uh, at every day, but I can tell you I work almost all the weekends. I'm always at some event on weekends. I'm um, three or four nights a week. I'm going to meetings. Now, you know, I, I don't complain about that as part of the job. When I signed up, when I put my hat in the ring, I knew that that was going to be expected. My wife is okay with it. Our children are grown and gone. She knows it's as part of the expectation for me. Um, I believe I'm, I'm making a difference. I, I care about all of the county. I'm a county commissioner for all of Tillamook County. That's North County, Central County, and South County. I spend a lot of time on a basis to listen to their concerns because city concerns are also county concerns. I, I develop relationships. I think it's really, really, really important that you develop relationships and to get things done. I work with, with all the ports. Um, I care about the people of Tillamook County. I care about their issues. Uh, 
like to have another four years. I, I think I'm uh, effective in some areas. I try my best to be effective. I try my best to solve the hard problems. I have good relationships with our senators, uh, both at the state and, and uh, federal level, with our representatives. Um, you know, I have no problem at all with uh, getting on the phone and calling Congressman Schrader. I've got his personal number and calling him back in Washington, D.C. Hi, Mark, how you doing? I said, well, Congressman, I've got this issue. Um, I talk to Senator Johnson almost on a daily basis, Representative Boone. I make sure that, that they know our issues. Um, here's a classic example, the rest area that was going to close with ODOT. I worked very closely with Senator Johnson, said we got to keep this rest area open. She was able to work a bill, and guess what? The Tillamook rest area got included in that bill, and we saved the rest area. Well, it's part of because I've got a relationship with her, and I told her this is important to us. It's not a big deal to a lot of folks, but it is to those tourists that stop at those rest areas. So, I mean, that's just another example of where, you know, I try to solve problems.